And at this time, I would now like to welcome our first speaker, Lauren Burlicamp. I'd like to thank the University of Finley and John Stanovich and the College of Pharmacy for hosting this well-rounded and timely discussion on medical cannabis. I'm honored to have been invited to give this presentation alongside Dr. Berla Camp and Zach Thomas, both who I have much respect for. While my professional credentials are with the hemp industry, I'm not speaking on behalf of any of those organizations. The policy goals of the agricultural hemp community is to get non-drug cannabis descheduled and treated like our other commodity crops whereas my per personal focus is on the value of medical cannabis and the failure of the drug war. The views I'm presenting are, uh, I have personally researched and are my own for the sake of educating you on the potential positive outcomes of Ohio's legalization. I fully acknowledge my privilege as my parents are both doctorates of pharmacotherapy and I'm fortunate enough to be able to have collegiate level conversations and debates with them about policy and public health concerns on a broad spectrum of issues and occasionally with their colleagues. I'm a strong supporter of our right to know about what we are putting into our bodies, whether it is food, water, medicine, food is medicine. We have the right to know where these substances came from, how they are going to affect my body, who produced them, how they were produced. Uh, and I'm a conscious consumer and an avid label reader because I consider myself a patient case. I deal with a recurring acute pain episode every month, uh, which weakens my immune system and aggravates digestive sensitivities. I believe that in the right form, the properties of medical cannabis may be able to help my condition. I'm a patient advocate because I personally know people who have been illegally healed by cannabis, and I feel strongly about their right to safe access. It is not safe for patients right now who are caught in the middle of this debate. So let's get started. Um, when I speak about the plant with a scientist or to a scientifically disciplined audience, I prefer to use the term cannabis because that's a scientific name. I find the word marijuana to be too politically stigmatized as it relates to the beginning of prohibition for a scientific discussion on the very real therapeutic benefits of the plant and its properties. <coughs> The American Pharmacy Association feels the same way as it is discussed on their website. They also accepted the following policy statement last December and doubled down this August. The association supports regulatory changes for more research into clinical efficacy and encourages healthcare provider education to support the development of this discipline. It also advocates that, that pharmacists assist patients and treat their confidential patient profiles the same as any other prescription medication when documenting use. And if it is legal in your area, the association supports pharmacist participation in furnishing it to make it safely available. Note that the association opposes pharmacist involvement with regard to adult use, also known as recreational. So if you weren't already aware of pharmacists and future pharmacists, you are very much needed in developing best practices for patient care outcomes within this discipline. By contrast, here's a statement by the American Medical Association about cautiously wanting more study of patient smoking marijuana to relieve symptoms. I would like to point out that the AMA committee, schooled in Western medicine protocols, have no experience or formal training with regard to the endocannabinoid system. This system, found in humans and animals, synthesizes cannabinoids between the immune system and the central nervous system. Dr. Berlecamp will be discussing it in more detail during her portion of the presentation. But this system was only discovered in the mid-90s and was not known to exist when the committee members all attended medical school. The total lack of mention of this endocannabinoid system by the AMA indicates that to me that it was just not considered in the AMA's statements. The fact is, is that the U.S. government's 80-year prohibition of medical cannabis research has denied these MDs practical knowledge, while other, other world leaders like the United Kingdom and Israel have established science-based conclusions that were not considered for whatever reason. Not considering a newly discovered human system does not bode well if you want to be the source of scientific knowledge for the efficacy of cannabis. And with regard to this conclusion and any further discussion on administering cannabis, you do not have to smoke it to receive medical benefit.
Which brings me to sharing some grace in honor of the pursuit of knowledge. One of my favorite quotes inscribed on the outer wall of the Toledo Public Library offers this insight. There is no shame in not knowing, only in refusing to learn. It is not your fault that you do not know about the discipline of the endocannabinoid system. We are students for life, no matter what your credentials are. I have so much respect for my parents and how seriously they take the responsibility of their professions. Pharmacists are gatekeepers of pharmacological information and regularly catch fatal mistakes with regard to improper prescriptions, dosing, and drug interactions, all for best patient outcomes. We need to understand the real science as the key to increasing access to medical cannabis and driving forward efficacy research. The implications of the drug war are very serious, but I'm not here to shame anyone for not knowing the information I'm about to share regarding its origins. I have compassion for your lack of understanding, because I came from the same place. Compassion is what truly matters with regard to pe best patient outcomes. It matters when you take your oaths to the integrity of your practice. It matters when dealing with colleagues, the misinformed public, and of course, all of the patients who will greatly benefit as the medical community reaches consensus on the healing power of cannabis. We are all in this together. The prohibition of cannabis is a huge mistake that wasn't based on real science. And you, as the future of pharmacy, have the opportunity to catch it and save someone's life. Because of my credentials in the hemp industry, I think it's important for me to distinguish the legal difference between hemp and medical cannabis, which is based on the level of THC content, or tetrahydrocannabinol. THC is the psychotropic cannabinoid found in the cannabis plant that only becomes active when heated and decarboxylation occurs. Medical cannabis refers to the use of the cannabis plant and its cannabinoid properties to treat disease or improve symptoms. Plants are grown horticulturally in a climate-controlled environment, like a greenhouse or a room, for the flower and vegetation, usually to produce some amount of THC based on its intended therapeutic use. Industrial hemp refers to the varieties of the cannabis plant and its products, which include fiber from the stalk and mineral-rich, high-protein, high-essential fatty acid foods from the seed and seed oil. These varieties are legally required to have less than 0.3% THC on a dry weight basis in order to be certified as hemp. Plants are grown agriculturally in a field for stalk and seed like our other commodities. Both medical cannabis and hemp are species cannabis. Different varieties of subspecies have different cannabinoid profiles with varying levels of THC. So that level of THC is, it's, determines whether it is considered hemp. Here is a scientific drawing of the two primary cultivars of the cannabis species. We have cannabis sativa on the left, which has a thinner leaf and less ability to produce THC. Hemp cultivars are cannabis sativa and have the potential to grow a tall, thin stem anywhere from 10 to 15 feet tall. And then we have cannabis indica over there on the right, which has a, I'm sorry, on, this, is, this is your right, this is your left. Um, <laughs> Uh, which is a broader waxy leaf and an increased ability to produce THC. It can grow quite bushy and is what the majority of medical cannabis strains originate from. Curiously enough, hemp is considered as, nutri as a nutritional superfood and hemp products are 100% legal to buy in the U.S. at places like Whole Foods, Kroger, Giant Eagle, that's not an endorsement. It's just illegal for our far farmers to grow in the U.S. because of its polit politicized confusion with marijuana. Hemp has arguably fallen victim to the biggest case of plant misidentification ever, all with, just within the last 80 years that we've been a country. With the next few slides, I'm going to discuss the timeline of cannabis in American history up through prohibition. There are some historical hemp facts that coincide because they were prohibited at the same time. While I'm not going to go into detail about each point, all of these facts are relevant to understanding the depth of confusion over why it remains a Schedule I. Some facts are also relevant to possible test questions. On this slide, I'm going to direct your attention to the fourth bullet down, right here, with, uh, which notes that cannabis, for, cannabis first entered the US pharmacopoeia in 1851, thanks to the work of William O'Shaughnessy. Throughout the early 20th century, what we understand today is marijuana the drug and the plant were commonly known as cannabis or hemp. Use of, the, use of the word marijuana notoriously spread amidst unfounded racist fears by some very powerful white men who used their influence to demonize the plant. 
It is important to note that racial segregation was in full effect through the Jim Crow laws and racial discrimination and prejudice was unfortunately very common in American society then. Here are some great historical pictures of different preparations of cannabis in capsules, powdered extract, alcohol tinctures, and so on. It is also interesting to note where these were made. We have Chicago, Cincinnati, Philadelphia, Cincinnati. It also looks like this particular one could have helped with my particular condition. Whether the following men colluded to protect their special interests or not is still unclear, but the intention was the same. Use racist fears of immigrants and people of color to demonize cannabis as marijuana. This is media mogul William Randolph Hearst, who used his media empire for such propaganda. Here are some examples that you can review later, but you got him talking about a Mexican family going insane after they accidentally harvested some marijuana alongside of their vegetables and ate them for dinner and went crazy. Um, strange Mexican weed, uh, paralysis uh, affecting musicians in Chicago, jazz musicians. And here is Harry J. Anslinger, the first head to the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, who later, which later became the DEA. Anslinger forbid almost all medical cannabis research through his political power and held that position for over 30 years. He said very racially charged things as a public official that I cannot believe as a public official he got away with. Here are some examples of his reefer madness era propaganda that you can also review later, but for some reason they're injecting marijuana right there. In 1937, the U.S. passed the first federal law against cannabis, ironically enough, despite the objections of the American Medical Association. Dr. William C. Woodward, their legislative attorney, testified on behalf of the AMA, telling Congress that the AMA knows of no evidence that marijuana is a dangerous drug, that marijuana is not the correct term, yet the burden of this bill is placed heavily on the doctors and pharmacists of this country, and that prohibition loses sight of the fact that future investigation may show that there are substantial medical uses for cannabis. How right he was. The Marijuana Tax Act of 1937 effectively banned cannabis use, production, and sales, including for industrial hemp, unless you had a specially issued stamp that the government refused to issue anyone. Such was the confusion over prohibition of marijuana that even after the, late, the, even after the law was passed, Popular Mechanics published a three-page spread in their February 1938 issue touting hemp as the next billion dollar crop. So this is that two pages of that print, so there's actually three pages. And this is the stamp, the special st stamp that you needed if you wanted to be a producer of marijuana during the war. Uh, the USDA's Hemp for Victory propaganda film encouraged farmers to go over uh, 150,000 acres of hemp for parachutes, navy rope, and other textiles specifically for the war effort. So even after they prohibited its cultivation, they realized they needed to use it for the war and started assigning these stamps. But, after, but the federal government stopped promoting hemp and medical cannabis completely after the war ended. This slide talks about the LaGuardia Report released by New York City's Mayor Fiorella LaGuardia that refuted Anslinger's negative claims of Oh, I'm sorry. That refuted Anslinger's negative claims of marijuana causing people to be violent. Anslinger threatened jail for anyone involved in this study and basically banned the research then. Here is some of the government propaganda for the Hemp for Victory campaign. And you can watch the 11 minute Hemp for Victory video found on YouTube. I highly recommend it. So we're fast forwarding to Nixon listing marijuana next to heroin as a Schedule I, but commissioned a study to determine whether it had any medical benefits. In 1972, the Schaefer Commission that he had assigned to this task concluded that marijuana prohibition should be ended and that the confusion over its medical benefits was due to the exaggerated claims of reefer madness. However, Nixon threw out these findings and started the drug war. Here is Nixon 
with a famous quote. Similarly to Prohibition's early motivations, Nixon was also prone to prejudicial generalizations to demonize marijuana use among certain cultures of people. In this case, it was the Jewish community. Have you ever wondered where the rumor that cannabis kills brain cells came from? In 1974, Governor of California Ronald Reagan cites a study by Dr. Robert G. Heath of Tulane University, which purported to find brain damage in monkeys that had been heavily dosed with cannabis. After six years of research, I'm sorry, after six years of requests in suing the government, research methodology was released to journalists. The study involved strapping monkeys down and pumping them with the equivalent of 63 Colombian strength joints in five minutes through gas masks, losing no smoke. In reality, the monkeys were suffocated. Three to five minutes of oxygen deprivation causes brain damage, whether you're inhaling cannabis smoke or not. The original conclusion of this study was repeated over and over in anti-marijuana government propaganda for decades. During the Ford year, also noting on this slide, uh, the Ford administration uh, had, along with NIDA and the DEA, banned any further federal cannabis research and only permitted pharmaceutical companies to research medical cannabis. <clears throat> Here's a depiction of the study and it's as a drawing and then up here you have Ronald Reagan and a cigarette ad. This slide discusses the Compassionate Investigational New Drug Study Program started in 1976, which I will let Dr. Berlekamp explain a little bit more. As this program is implemented, President Jimmy Carter endorses the previous Schaefer Commission findings from Nixon's administration and asks Congress to decriminalize cannabis possession in the states. This effort to shift the policy conversation towards compassion was ended abruptly by the new President Reagan's aggressive anti-drug rhetoric and Nancy's just, Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign, campaign. Reagan's administration also sought to destroy all federal cannabis research from 1966 to 1976, though it was unsuccessful. In 1988, the DEA's own chief administrative judge, Francis Young, rules that cannabis has medical value, but the DEA director, John, Lor John Lawn, ordered that cannabis remain a Schedule I. Each administration following, whether through harsher penalties, penal sorry, excuse me, whether through harsher, pen harsher penalties or keeping positive research hidden, they perpetuated misinformation because tough on crime got the votes and made society feel safer during uncertain times. The number of people behind bars for nonviolent non drug law offenses increased from 50,000 in 1980 to over 400,000 by 1997. And now we are in the age of mass incarceration where we as the United States of America have the largest prison population in the world. Despite the continued drug war, in 2003, the United States of America, as represented by the Department of Health and Human Services, is awarded a patent declaring the properties in cannabis are beneficial and that these cannabinoids are antioxidants and neuroprotectants. That's right, our own government has a policy declaring marijuana, aka cannabis, as having no medical value, while simultaneously holding a patent 6630507 since 2003 stating that, it, that its properties would be useful in treating neurological damage from stroke and trauma or in the treatment of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, or HIV dementia. We have to get with the times, people. We need to encourage compassionate curiosity in the pursuit of knowledge around medical cannabis now more than ever. If, and if Ohio passes legalization, this will put you as, the, as Ohio's medical community at the forefront of global research. I'd also like to note the specific mention of the cannabinoid known as CBD or cannabidiol, which is a non-psychoactive cannabinoid that is also found in hemp and, many, and has many anti-inflammatory therapeutic properties. So right in there, cannabidiol. And Dr. Berla Camp will talk a little bit more about that. For far too long, cannabis has been equated with deadlier drugs. Here is a chart from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that shows the very stark contrast comparing the number of toxic overdose deaths by what we consider to be dangerous drugs. 
As, and as you can see, with marijuana, the number is zero because there has never been a death by toxic overdose of cannabis ever. People may suffer a psychotic break from too much THC consumption that leads them to harmful behavior, but no one has ever died from a cannabis overdose, period. I feel that it, this, I feel that one of the most dangerous implications of the drug war has been leaving cannabis as a Schedule One listing, claiming that it is as dangerous as heroin when it simply is not. We've been telling our kids this, they end up trying cannabis and statistically speaking, don't have a deadly experience, thinking they've been lied to about all of the dangers they've heard from the adults about drugs. They end up trying heroin, anticipating the same result and end up dead, at least 4,000 of them a year. And we have a very serious epidemic here in Ohio with regard to heroin deaths and prescription painkiller deaths as well. But according to a study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, it's states that have legalized medical cannabis saw a 25% drop in prescription painkiller deaths. That is what is known as harm reduction. But in just looking at all of the deaths between heroin, cocaine, prescription painkillers, and alcohol combined, they do not even come close to the deaths by tobacco. It's 48 or 400, 480,000. Zero. Which brings me to my next point, which is this. It is unscientific to compare the hazards of smoking tobacco with smoking cannabis. They are two completely different plant species with different chemical properties. Cannabis has cannabinoids, tobacco has nicotine. Cannabis smoke and tobacco smoke are not equally carcinogenic, but note that if both are sprayed with certain chemicals while they're growing, the smoke from either has the potential to be more harmful if they hadn't been sprayed with chemicals. Here is a cannabis flower growing in a cannabis field. And here's one for my fellow nerds, a cannabis flower under a microscope. These are terpenes, all kinds of colorful things. The Schedule One listing of cannabis also states that it is a high potential risk for addiction. There are two publications that have made much needed updates to the addiction conversation. The first up there is a recent book by Johan Hari called Chasing the Scream, which dives deep, deep into studies about addiction, looking at traditional addiction studies that showed if you put a rat in a cage with two water bottles, one filled with, with water and the other filled with cocaine or another addictive chemical substance, that the rat will eventually neglect its health and die addicted to the water bottle with the addictive substance. Recently, the studies have been adapted to inclu include a version where the rats are put in a cage with other rats and toys and the best food, and again with the two water bottles, one with pure water and the other with an addictive chemical substance, and they found that because the rats had a higher quality of life, while each of, one, each, while each of them tried the substance-laced water, they didn't fall into addiction and led normal, healthy rat lives with their other rat friends. What is our society's harshest penalty other than death? Solitary confinement. Isolation. So of course the rats in those earlier studies died from their addictions. They had nothing better to live for. So sobriety isn't the opposite of addiction. Meaningful human connection is the opposite of addiction. One's quality of life is the determining factor on whether that person feels a need to fill a void with a chemical substance or a habit, a habit that triggers a dopamine response. Why does sex sell? Because it taps into that instinctive desire for human connection. People can be addicted to all kinds of non-drug behaviors in order to cope, such as gambling, shopping, Facebook. <laughs> I've heard that if we, if we legalize marijuana, there's an increased public health risk for addiction. Well, as it turns out, the most important public health study you've never heard of all ties the likelihood of addiction not to the availability of substances, but to the number of traumatic experiences someone had as a child. <clears throat> Plain and simple, addiction is caused by a poor quality of life as a child. Addicts need compassion more than anyone. Thankfully, there are some communities catching on to this. And here is uh, Gloucester, uh, Massachusetts. Curiously enough, Massachusetts was the first state to ban cannabis or marijuana way back in the early 1900s. And here they are. Um, helping heroin users and not charging them with crimes if they come in and turn themselves in. 
Here are the indications of an ACE, or an adverse childhood experience. There are four bolded on this slide that I feel have an increased probability of happening because of the drug war. And what do, for, what do four or more ACEs mean for a male child compared to a male child with no ACEs? That child who experienced that much trauma is 4,800% more likely to end up with an intravenous drug addiction. Just from having an alcohol or drug user in their family, a member being imprisoned or wrongfully imprisoned, biological parents not being present, a childhood illness that could have been helped by cannabis medicine. This Kaiser Permanente study reviewed more than 17,000 cases over many years with definitive math pointing the finger directly at us over how we perpetuate the public health problem of addiction by simply how we treat patients like criminals over nonviolent possession of drugs. Prohibition has lasted 80 years, and the negative implications of this failed policy are more than we could have ever imagined. We must stop treating patients like criminals. The costs of the drug war are staggering. Especially considering the unscientific racist intentions behind the beginning of prohibition and the current racial disparities of drug arrests. In a study by the American Civil Liberties Union, it was found that blacks are four times more likely than whites to be arrested for possession of cannabis in Ohio, even though consumption rates are the same. These arrests cost us around $120 million a year, and the bottom line is that the drug war is an expensive failure when directed at the user, whether they are a legitimate patient or just simply someone coping. While Ohio decriminalized as a state, here's a map of areas that still have harsher penalties locally that you can review later. One of the things to look forward to is if, if issue three passes, we'll be, we will be able to continue toward a more compassionate society by giving people a fresh start who have been affected by a nonviolent cannabis charge in their record. A single nonviolent possession charge can mark someone for life with hundreds of implications that affect their ability to achieve a higher quality of life. I encourage you to read more about this initiative that will be ready to vote on by the Ohio General Assembly if Ohio legalizes on November 3rd. Here is a policy statement by the Law Enforcement Against Prohibition that I encourage you to review. We are discovering every day more and more about how wrong we are as a society to let the drug war continue another minute. 90% of Ohioans want to see a medical cannabis program, according to a Quinnipiac poll, and a majority want full legalization. Ohio's legislature has no interest in ending prohibition or even crafting a medical alternative, which they could have done with issue two, but instead crafted their legislative initiative to explicitly block issue three and further restrict our ability to get another legalization option on the ballot in the future as citizens. This is what bad government looks like, folks. I'm going to skip this slide because it appears to be out of order, but does it discuss disease clusters in Ohio? It's not like the state doesn't have guidance from the federal government. This is the Cole Memorandum released in 2013 to help guide state enforcement around marijuana legalization. The Department of Justice found as a matter of policy that state authorized marijuana activities were less likely to threaten the enumerated federal policies than unauthorized activities. So what are they waiting for? Which brings us to one of the most important decisions we will ever have the opportunity to make as Ohioans to end this war that has gone on long enough. Issue three will legalize medical cannabis and adult use while establishing 10 initial constitutionally protected properties that a regulatory commission will have the option to expand after close observation to the rollout. Issue three will appear on the ballot with inflammatory language, implying it is a monopoly, which it isn't, in order to scare voters because the ballot language was written by a career a politician elected official who isn't interested in ending prohibition, no matter what it looks like. Why is this a constitutional amendment? Because every citizen initiative attempting to legalize cannabis is a constitutional amendment, so that a hostile state legislature can't immediately overturn it. Before any of these facilities or grow operations put a seed in the soil, Governor Kasich will be legally required to immediately appoint 
a, nonpart a nonpartisan seven-member committee to write rules for how the law will be implemented and clarify regulations on things like edibles and marketing to children. Regulations that the entities will have to abide by, or re these regulations will be such that the entities will have to abide by or else they will not legally be able to operate. If the commission writes rules that any of the license holders violate, the licenses can be revoked and assigned to a different entity. Members may not have served as elected public officials uh, in the eight years prior to their appointment if they are on the co control commission. Um, sorry, I don't want to get tased. <laughs> I really don't. Um, and they include, so uh, a licensed Ohio physician, a licensed Ohio attorney, uh, an Ohio-based patient advocate, could be a pharmacist, an Ohio resident with a demonstrated experience in the legal marijuana industry, an Ohio <coughs> resident with a demonstrated experience in business, a sworn Ohio law enforcement officer, and an Ohio <coughs> citizen member of the public uh, would make up this commission, overseen by the governor. Here's a list of licenses able to be issued or revoked by the commission, including wholesale grow, cultivation extraction facilities, marijuana product manufacturing facilities, adult use retail stores, nonprofit medical dispensaries, and personal home grow. The 10 constitutionally protected properties will be home to the wholesale grow, cultivation, and extraction facilities and will be located in Butler, Claremont, Franklin, Hamilton, Licking, Lorraine, Lucas, Delaware, Stark, and Summit counties. If the commission writes rules that any of these license holders violate, Licenses can be revoked and assigned to a different entity. Commercial growth will be restricted to the 10 properties, but again, violators of the rules could be removed by the commission. There will be additional administrative operational oversight of six marijuana testing facilities with the option to create more. There will also be a jobs incubator, incubator set up in Cuyahoga County. A lot of complaints around the promise of revenues from the casino issue, so, excuse me, the. A lot of complaints around the promise of revenues from the casino initiative. Where did it all go? This amendment explicitly lays out exactly where the re revenue will go. To local governments, public safety, public safety, infrastructure, mental health and addiction prevention treatment services, research, and the medical cannabis program, among other things. Because medical patients and adult consumers will consume legally produced marijuana in Ohio, it is imperative that it be fully tested for potency and chemical makeup. Here's the beginning list of conditions that would be approved for medical cannabis use, which the commission will be able to add to as needed. And for the sake of time, you can review this later. Um, we'll also uh, promote the research to determine what other conditions might be helped by medical cannabis. Uh, and we may be able to, excuse me. Stop here. Oh, I'm already at 35 minutes. Sure. Um, there is a research facility that could be in, uh, in Licking County, and Ohio State University is interested in researching there too. We have an opportunity before us to end a war. There are other implications, there are obviously health implications to legalizing cannabis, but I think that we, as in adults in this modern era, can figure out how to work together to come up with compassionate solutions. You can save someone you love with cannabis. Thank you. <laughs>